For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is Emeritus Professor at Vets University, Barry Dolatsky, here to unpack his memoir titled Coded History, My Life of New Beginnings. Your memoir details how you found yourself unexpectedly lying in a London hospital bed, more concerned about the contents of your briefcase under your bed than the prospects of your life ending in five to six months. So briefly tell us what inspired you to agently pen down this memoir. I'll be careful not to give away any secrets in the book, but uh, one of the things that the book starts with is me finding out in 1987 that I had a, a disease called hairy cell leukemia. And in 1987, it was untreatable. And what? And I was um, living in London in self-imposed exile. And the uh, doctors treating me said that there wasn't much they could do. And I had about six months to live. And as the blurb says, I was more worried about what was in my briefcase than finding out that I didn't have a long time to live. But people will have to read the book to find out what was in my briefcase. Aha. In terms of me writing the book, so I did survive, as you can see. I lived longer than six months, much longer. And in about um, 20... 18, two things happened. Well, the first thing happened in 2018. And I, um, I'm uh, very involved in the South African IT industry. And I was at the awards of the personality of the year. And a young man, Tiani Ngoyama, won the award as the IT personality of the year. And in making a speech, he thanked me for being such an inspiration to him. And I thought a lot and thought, I've mentored um, Tiani. He knows a little bit about me, but he doesn't know much about me. And I thought I needed to share more of my story with the people around me and feel inspired by me, especially young people. Uh, the second inspiration was um, sort of much closer to my personal life. And it started in about 2019, but I had a... a a recurrence of my leukemia, and I was on treatment. And I read a Facebook page of a person who I didn't know, but I knew about, who was another academic living in another part of South Africa. And he wrote in Facebook about dying of leukemia and how he felt his memories bubbling away and disappearing. And I thought, what happens to one when one dies, I mean, it was such a thing and made even more real during COVID. And when we die, our memories go, you know, they're in our heads and then they're gone. And I thought that I really need to capture some of my memories in a book or in writing. So that's what got me writing my memoir. And why do you say that if someone were to ask you when you became politically and socially conscious, you would choose the early morning moment in the Lesotho Mountains as one of your life's key turning points? So that was when I was 20 years old, a long time ago, in 1971. And I grew up as, we, as a white South African boy in apartheid South Africa. And I had very little understanding of the country and what it was about. The success of apartheid was it kept us separate. So a person my age with my intelligence and everything living in Soweto or living in Alex would know very little about my life as I knew about their life. So we were kept very separate and I joined a student organization in my second year at FITS called the South African Voluntary Service. And what we did is we would go into rural parts of Southern Africa and we would work on projects, building schools and clinics. And although building a school or building a clinic had value, I think the greater value was to those white South Africans who went into rural parts of South Africa and saw the reality of apartheid. For the first time in my life, 
I saw children with malnutrition. I saw a village where there were no men. All the men were away working on the gold mines. There were a few men who had come back with life-threatening injuries. And there were old men who had been worn out by a life of work in the mines. And sitting in that Lesotho village on a piece of grass watching the sun come up, I suddenly realized that how, how my privilege and their underdevelopment were two sides of the same coin. So how I managed to live a privileged life as a white South African was directly related to that village where the labor had been sucked out and the energy and the life had been sucked out of young men who went to work in the gold mines that paid the taxes that made me live the privileged life I lived. So I didn't think of it as clearly as that as a 20-year-old, but I started to see that there were pieces in the jigsaw puzzle of my world that really didn't fit, you know, it didn't all work. It wasn't clear what was happening in my world. And talk to us more about why you chose voluntary exile to avoid saving in South Africa's apartheid era army. So I left South Africa in uh, 1979 and I left with a PhD. And the, the, the major reason that I had a PhD was to keep out of the South African army. So when I, I finished school, I, I matriculated in 1969 and at that time, all white men were conscripted into the army. So it was compulsory. You had to go and serve in the army. And I served for nine months in the army. I was a cook in the kitchen, but I was still part of the army. And, and with my growing political consciousness, I couldn't serve in that army. The army was being used as a weapon to as a, a force to support and grow and entrench apartheid and also to attack neighboring countries. So I made up my mind in my years at WITS that I would never, ever go back to the army. It, it was obligated that every, per, every white man, until they were the age of 40, had to go and spend a few months every year in the army. The one way you could keep out of the army was to be a full-time student. So I stayed on as a student till I had my PhD. I wanted a reason not to go to the army. And in uh, 1979, I had finished my PhD, and I would have then been called up every year to go to the army. And I could have refused and gone to jail, or I could have left and gone to live somewhere else. So I went to live in England with the intention of coming back as soon as I can to one of the neighboring countries in Southern Africa, Mozambique, in fact. And why did your opposition to apartheid distance you from your profession? So, uh, you know, I, I trained as an engineer and I've always worked as an engineer. So I'm in a, and I'm a, a software engineer. Um, at the time, and I know it's a stereotype and a, why, you know, a, a generalization, but most engineers that I came across, particularly students, were quite um, um, apolitical or politically right-wing. So they didn't really perceive themselves as being part of, of the left or part of change. They saw themselves as more part of the establishment and I stuck out like a sore thumb, me and others, well, it wasn't only me, but there were a few engineers who didn't see themselves as being part of the mainstream professional grouping that clustered around um, the apartheid state. So I was very much at a, at a tangent to what my colleagues were. Tell us about Logical Research, a company you, Peter Wallstead, and Dennis Prager registered to sell software developed by the three of you. Yeah, so, you know, there, there are many strands that run through my life. And 
One Strand is I am an innovator and an entrepreneur. And my first attempt at entrepreneurship and innovation happened in England. I was working in Manchester at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. And without going into technical details, I developed as part of my work a very innovative computer program, which we called Plasma. And I could have just given it away or left it to sit in my laboratory at UMIS. But my supervisor, Peter Wellstead, and one of his ex-students, Dennis Praga, uh, decided to form a company called Logical Research. And we formed the company in the early 1980s. And it was a spin-out. It was a startup. So it was our own startup company to sell software. As happens in many startups, we weren't successful. We sold a few pieces of software, but we never made a go of the company. But it wasn't, you know, there's never a failure in entrepreneurship. We learned a lot by doing that. And I did go on to launch more successful companies after that. Briefly talk to us about how Thatcherism and the defeat of trade unions in Britain in the 1980s, together with similar developments in the USA, under Ronald Reagan set the scene for a huge change in how the global economy operated. If we look at the world today, it was largely shaped by what happened in the 1980s. So without giving your viewers a history lesson, I'll say that before the 1980s, uh, there was that post-war uh, social contract. There was sort of agreement between workers and um, people who, who owned capital to work together. And, and, and we saw in Europe especially the growth of the welfare state and trade unionism was very powerful. And it was the way the world worked for the 20 years or so after the Second World War. And then came Thatcher in Britain, Margaret Thatcher, and Reagan in America. And I don't know if they met in secret and decided this, but the kind of ideology that came out of Thatcher and Reagan was to move Western countries to a, a service economy and move manufacturing to the East. So there was a real change in how they saw the world, and they saw the global North as being the controller of finance and provider of services, and the global South as being the factory, the producer. And that was only made possible by smashing the trade unions and in Britain, what Margaret Thatcher went about doing was to break the power of the trade union. So there was a big strike in the coal mining industry, in the printing industry. And in that, she broke the power of the unions and allowed production to move to the East, to China and India, and left Britain as largely a service economy and a financial hub. Similar things, but much more complicated, happened in the US as well. And lastly, Prof, in recent years, you have helped VET University establish an excellent computer training facility. So tell us about your work in academia. I came back to South Africa from the UK in 1989, and I I came back as a researcher and experienced in working within the software industry, the digital economy. And I realized WITS had huge potential to play a role in building a South African and African digital economy. So through the last 30 years, what I've done is focused a lot of my attention on how you build a strong digital economy in our region. And at the heart of it is a center that I created in 2005 called the Joburg Center for Software Engineering. 
And, um, and out of that, we created a digital innovation hub in Juta Street in Bramfontein called the Tsimolochong Digital Innovation Precinct. So I played a role in creating both the JCSE and Tsimolochong. And through that, we've been working not only with university students, but very broad-based groupings of people that come from communities outside of the university to grow digital skills and promote digital best practice. So that's been my life's work, really, in growing the South African digital ecosystem. That was Professor Barry Dolatsky speaking to Krima Media's polity about coded history, my life of new beginnings.